I flew to England and we rehearsed, did like a few short rehearsals. And then uh, my first gig was Royal Albert Hall filmed for a DVD and <laughs> uh, cable TV. Love it. Special. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Welcome to the Who. Exactly. I think we ran through most of the songs before we started performing them. I, there might have been a couple that we never ran through. I, it's, wow. Man. <laughs> It's that is a fly by the seat of your pants gig, man. It's crazy. Don't be sitting down, king without a crown. No time for hesitation. If I slip, I won't rebound. Looking life and notice, I control my own fate. Disappointment stumbles in. How much can my soul take? But I'm doing this for more than me. Live my life accordingly. Know the bigger picture is depicted through the worth I bring. Back to my people, post the challenge, we can make it. Prefer dream catching over all the dream chasing. That means Welcome to the ideas for the open minded T cast. Here, we explore social issues with unique people and perspectives through productive conversation while purposefully excluding politicism to promote good, standalone ideas. Our guests and our listeners are people with open minds and open ears who seek to learn from others so that we can make this world a better place. So let's do this. John Button. Musician and bass player extraordinaire. It's not just a guy who played and recorded with the likes of Michelle Branch, Sheryl Crow, Shakira, Robbie Dracorosa, and most recently, The Who. He is much more. John is a successful musician, husband, father, and is like a brother to me. Success doesn't come easy, though he might make it sound so. It's an honor to have my brother and former bandmate on the cast. Welcome, John Button. Hello. JB. <laughs> what up? How you doing, man? Oh, I'm pretty well. How are you? I'm very well. You're over there uh, in your house for the fourth straight month. Oh, <laughs> yes, I am. I mean, thank thankfully, our house is, is a pretty nice place to be trapped. So... Well, that's it's not a, so bad. That's a good thing. All right. Well, I didn't, I didn't, I certainly didn't call you to hear you complain because I don't think anybody wants to hear that. We all have our own lists. <laughs> no kidding. But I have, I have less complaints than, than most. <laughs> well, good. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to chat. I know, uh, this is a, a little less, um, or a little more formal of a, of a convo than we would maybe have over lunch or something, but. Uh, you have so much to share and you have such an interesting life. And I think there's a lot of people that'd be interested in your perspectives and how you got there. And I mean, you have a successful family now. You've had a good education. You've got a good career going and trying. Not I'm not sure about all that, but <laughs> you're well, kind. <laughs> we're we're going to try really hard not to jinx it, too, because that's not the purpose here. <laughs> <Right>? either. <laughs> but uh, why don't we start oh, gotcha. out by giving me a little bit of of your background in terms of like where you grew up. Cause I think that's also a unique part of your story because where you grew up isn't in the middle of LA and learning all the game there. True. Yeah. And I, I, I think it definitely affects who I am and how I move through the world. So yeah, I grew up in the little town of Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, that's a community of about when I grew up there it was about 70,000 people, I think. Um, and that's in central Alaska. So we get down to about three hours of sunlight in the winter, which is interesting. Oh, Lord. It's, you know, dark for most, you know, you go to school, it's dark. You get out of school, it's dark. Um, wow. And then we have 20, 24 hour sunlight in the summer. Um, we're out in the middle of nowhere to an extent. I mean, not totally out in the middle of nowhere, but um, so, yeah, that was a pretty interesting and different way to grow up. And it kind of exposed you to, to more of a, I guess, a country culture, for lack of better terms. But, you know, it wasn't like a city-centric type thing where the music industry was thriving and everything like that. So how did you end up getting uh, an interest in music, in particular playing music up there? Um, well, uh, both my parents played music. Uh, my, my mom plays piano and sings, and my dad plays clarinet and saxophone. and um, my dad was really into like big band music when he grew up. He wanted to be like a big band leader for a minute. Um, so both my parents were into music, um, and they 
also really believed in uh, kids studying music just for enrichment and, you know, learning how to learn. And, it, you know, it helps with whatever endeavor you want to go into. Um, and so I think I think they believed in that philosophy. So uh, I'm the youngest of five kids. Um, and all my older siblings were very good musicians. Um, so I kind of almost didn't know that you did anything else. Like all my siblings and my parents are playing music. It's like, well, that's what you do. I didn't, I didn't, I honestly, I didn't know you didn't do that. That was just like what everybody did. So we started piano lessons super young. I started piano at like four. Um, so yeah. So without knowing the difference, do you feel like that's you know, how you also excelled. Cause I know there's a lot of people, you know, we try to differentiate between uh, natural talent and hustle and all these different things. And it doesn't, doesn't always compute with everybody, but if you're in that environment and you have really skilled older siblings that would tend to kind of motivate you to become better, or was there any specific age where you just targeted this as a type of way to make a living or just to be the best or anything like that? I think all of that. Um, I certainly think that uh, witnessing people playing music when you're like three years old, you kind of, I don't know, you sort of, uh, it helps you understand how music works. And I mean, my brother tells stories of me like picking out melodies on the piano when I was like three or four years old by ear. I have no recollection of that, but that's what he says I used to do. Um, um, so, and also getting that, uh, that sort of head start, your, your sort of trajectory as you move through life, you're always a step or two ahead. Um, I think so like, you know, you start playing in a group when you're 12 years old, if you've already had, you know, six years of music experience, you're going to get to play with better people at that young age which is going to sort of accelerate your growth. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. all sort of exponential. Um, and I think Malcolm Gladwell talks about that, right? Like uh, in okay. one of his books, he talks about the uh, the hockey players that are bigger at a certain age and they sort of get into the better hockey team and it just changes their trajectory based yeah. on like their birth date, right? Right. And um, that's usually that's, a, that's usually yeah. putting school kids in school at an, at an uh, older age as opposed to the younger age so that they're bigger, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So what I find interesting too is that there's a lot of parents who it sounded like your parents were like you 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 specified that they were encouraging and just they wanted you to be able to learn how to learn and learn how to excel at something and use your mind for different things, but they weren't trying to force it down your throat for a career path or anything else. And you find far from it. Right. And you know, a lot of parents, <laughs> including yourself. So you're a parent too. And I, and I know you have an interesting and appreciable, uh, parental philosophy also, but when you, you present a lot of things to your kids, I mean, I have friends now that have little kids and they're, you know, trying to introduce them to music. They're trying to introduce them to, you know, sp quasi sports or reading or whatever it is. Do you think it's just kind of symbiotic that you happen to actually have a passion for this as well as the head start? Do you think that's any kind of combination they're in? Boy, I, boy, I gotta say, I'm not sure about that. I mean, um, yeah, I, there must've been some sort of combination there, but I, yeah, at some point I, I just, you know, this, I just was what I wanted to do. I, from a pretty early, pretty early age, I think like, I want to say around nine or 10, I was sort of like, yeah, this is what I wanted to, this is what I want to do, you know? So what was the vision at nine or 10? What was the, you know, the dream to become the whatever, like your dad wanted to um, be the band leader. You want to be a what? Right. I actually wanted to be a session musician. Crazy enough. Like yeah. my, <laughs> so my oldest brother, he's 10 years older than me. Um, and he was a drummer. Um, and he was like, I remember him sort of, cueing me into the the band on David Letterman. He would always watch David uh -huh. Letterman be, and be like, you know, check out these guys in the band. It was at that time, it was Steve Jordan, Hiram Bullock, Will Lee, um, you know, all New York session guys. So he's like, you know, these are like session musicians and they play on people's albums and 
you know, he sort of schooled me on what that was. And I was like, that sounds cool. That's a cool idea. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So weirdly enough, I kind of, that's sort of what I wanted to do. So is that how you transitioned into going to college for music? And uh, how did you end up selecting North Texas? Um, I looked at a few schools. I mean, my heart, I kind of wanted to go to Berkeley. My oldest brother, the drummer, had gone to Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Um, and I was sort of, I, sort of eyeing that, like, oh, I wanted to do that. Um, but there are a couple problems with that for my parents. One, it's super expensive. <laughs> yeah. And two, but even more important, even more important than that, my dad wanted me to go to like an accredited university because my dad's a, a college professor. Science. Ah, ah. Um, so, you know, he wanted me to go to a proper university. <laughs> um, and so Berkeley isn't exactly that, I guess, you know, it's just a music school. Um, whereas university of North Texas is, you know, right there in its name, it's yeah. a university. Right. Um, you know, so when you, you know, if you take a, whatever your history or science class, you're taking a, you know, it's, it's from a, you know, proper professor though apparently at berkeley it's the same thing they get professors from other uh universities around boston so yeah. i don't want to take anything away from berkeley but anyway yeah. Yeah. um i got a scholarship to university of north texas it cost me almost nothing to go to school there it was in hindsight a super great decision because i didn't you know i didn't have to take out loans or anything like i got a really good deal on my education at north texas um and it's a an amazing music program there. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't mad at that. Right. And I remember you came in and you were what, 18, I guess when you got there, cause you were on the young side anyway. True. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, right out of high school, like, yeah. yeah. And you ended up finding success pretty quickly there. I think yeah, actually surprising to me. I mean, and that was sort of an interesting thing to me about growing up in Alaska. One of the things about growing up there is I really felt like I was isolated and I didn't know how I sort of stacked up against the quote unquote real world. You know, I just felt like I was in on this island, like sort of just trying to work my stuff out. I didn't really know how I compared. So then I arrived in North Texas and generally the vibe when you get there. So there are like nine different, uh, jazz bands there and you know they're stacked from best to worst um or best to least <laughs> to, good to least <laughs> least best yeah um and so and a lot of people you know i a few people that went to school there kind of prepared me for like hey you know you're probably not going to make it into a band when you first get there you won't make the bottom band yeah because especially you're talking in. about being a, a rhythm section player drums bass and guitars you're in a piano player. You're talking about out of however many hundred students there are, and there are still those nine bands. You're not like a sax player where you've got five in each big band to make, right? Great point. That's absolutely right. Um, so I was prepared for, you know, I'll do my best and, you know, hopefully I'll make a band. Um, but, I, you know, surprising to me, uh, my first semester, I was in the four o'clock. And then my second semester there, I made it in the two o'clock. Um, and actually kind of interestingly, I think, uh, so I did that first audition when I got there and I sort of clocked like, Hey, what are they auditioning me on to make the band? Hmm. And so that whole semester I was like, I'm going to work on that stuff, hmm. you know, very perceptive. Yeah. So, so then when I went in for this, my second audition for the second semester, I made it to the two o'clock. So yeah, that was that was an accomplishment for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so now that we know that you had a scholarship and all that stuff, were you working uh, anything outside of uh, doing working gigs and stuff to support yourself during that time? No, I mean I was fortunate that you know my parents could throw me a little bit of money here and there um, to su help support me. And yeah, I was I was making money playing gigs, you know, playing whatever like jazz combo in a hotel lobby or playing a wedding and all right. that kind yeah. of jobbing around stuff. Yeah. Beer money. Um, yeah. <laughs> so between those two things or those three things, the scholarship, the help of my parents. Um, and then actually 
Uh, I had a little bit of help from, so the state of Alaska has a thing called the permanent fund dividend, which is a long story, if, but interesting if anybody wants to look that up. Um, but it's basically reverse taxes. Like every citizen in the state gets a check every year instead of paying taxes, um, which is due to the amount of oil money that came in in the 80s. Wow. Um, Wow. Yeah. So, I, you know, it would end up being uh, something like 800 or a thousand bucks a year or something they give you. So, that, you know, that helps. Hey, I'll take it. Okay. So, um, so how did you transition from school? So obviously I know you're playing in bands of, of all kinds and all that kind of stuff. So you graduated and then you had what a, a year or so to make your decision. I can't remember how long you waited till you bolted. And what, what did that, interim period consist of in terms of figuring out the world now that you're loose right well you're assuming i graduated at that point <laughs> <laughs> you did right or did you not <gasps> not well you know it's a funny thing i did eventually <laughs> graduate um so uh in a nutshell I, I got to my you know my fourth year of college and i went to whatever the advisor and i was like okay i'm ready to graduate and they're like uh you're missing like two weird credits for i like electives or i just didn't have enough credits or something that was like i was like oh well well i'm not staying here any longer <laughs> you didn't have enough here. credits or patience at that point yeah exactly i ended up uh doing those credits at a community college in los angeles and transferring my credits back there and graduating Good for, for whatever reason um but so i knew i wanted to move to la um when i finished college um, but, uh, I had a gig playing with a pretty good, like kind of cover band that we did, you know, played bars and also played weddings and all that kind of stuff. Like, a, you know, and I was making pretty decent money with that band. I also had an apartment that I shared with another guy, uh, in Denton, Texas, that was the apartment was 180 bucks a month and we shared it. So my rent was $90 a month. Good Lord, you're not getting broken into every minute? I mean, where do you find that? <laughs> <laughs> Sucker, I you wish know, you'd have I, told me about that. I would have lived in the closet for that. Yeah, right? Um, so that was a pretty good deal. So I'm like, okay, I'm making good money in this band, and I'm paying 90 bucks a month rent. Let's hang here for a year. And I socked away as much money as I could. Um, so I had a nice... I, so I did that for a year and had a nice chunk of savings when I moved to LA. Very smart. So, so uh, I don't know. I don't know which of these topics to kind of get into in terms of your trajectory, but I I must say that um, that's an appreciable skill that you have that a lot of college kids don't have, which is they see what they need to do, and instead of just living in their car and waiting on a table, they actually come up with a plan that gets them there still in due time, but more responsibly so to where you actually have some nuggets in your pocket and you can hit the ground running. I think that's really admirable. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, you know, part of that is just dumb luck that it fell in my lap that I just, for whatever reason, I happen to have this cheap apartment and happen to, you know, be lucky enough to have this good gig making money playing bass. And I was like, well, you know, why throw this away right now you know yeah so okay so yeah it worked out so you just packed bags you go with some with some buddies or what yeah so i think there's three or four uh four of us yeah that you know got in our cars and caravaned across the country and rolled into la i i uh knew two people here so that was good love it two people in los angeles <laughs> <laughs> are they the ones that put on the fanfare when you all cross the state line can welcoming you in to la oh yeah totally yeah. okay good i knew it <laughs> i knew it oh my gosh so what did you do like you're talking about yellow pages days how do you go about uh starting from nowhere and establishing either relationships or working working gigs or whatever how do you go about doing something like that at least back then how did you do it um so <laughs> i i actually trained to do telemarketing when i got here i was like well i should get a job mm -hmm. you know um <laughs> i i think i made one phone call and i was just like oh this is not for me and i ran away <laughs> from there i was like well 
I've got this money I saved up, so I'm just going to live off of that. <laughs> um, uh, so those two people I knew were both musicians, um, and they had a couple of gigs here and there. And I would, you know, meet the people on those gigs. I would always, you know, show up do, trying to do my very, very best for whatever it was that I was doing. And, you know, I was playing with whoever I could play with. I mean, most of the stuff I was doing, I was making zero money. Um, just playing with singer songwriters or jams or anything. And, uh, yeah, just, you know, you meet people on a gig, they go, Hey, this guy's a pretty good bass player. And I, I got this other gig and, you know, you just sort of start networking. And if you, you know, if you, uh, if you're nice and cool and show up on time and do a good job, people notice, I guess. So you're a musician. You just said, show up on time. Do you mean that? Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> for me, I'm, I'm a, I'm a stickler about that. I know you um, are. I, and I think that's something, <laughs> That's something that, look, I mean, the only reason that you really find success, because this is a business, right? I mean, you can't it just is. be, hey, you know, we're all musicians. It's all cool. And my time is my time, not your time. So that's a that's a, a significant aspect of it that I think people should should recognize is that that's one that is one of your your key traits is that you're very much a, paying attention to the clock. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, you don't want to waste, you know, you want to be respectful of everybody's time and hopefully they're respectful of yours. And yeah, showing up on time is, is part of that. I mean, especially when, when you start talking about, you know, doing, when you start doing recording sessions and stuff like that, like you don't show up late for those. I mean, when the studio is costing however much and, you know, you got nine people that are all on the clock, right? you know, you show up late, man, that's, see you later. That's money. That th That doesn't happen twice. Right. Uh yeah. So so now you know you're you're kind of living gig to gig and this is where I kind of um compare what you do which is somewhat unenviable and enviable at the same time. But that is basically that every gig you tackle is your next job and when the gig is over you have to go find another job and it's and it's in essence is entrepreneurial. Right? Because you've got to essentially Absolutely. hustle each new day to get your next gig. So how did how did you handle yeah. that? Did you have any kind of a process or anything like that in terms of how you did, or did you even think of it like that? I think mainly the way I thought of it was just sort of like what I mentioned earlier. It's just like the gig you're on, you do the absolute best you can because that's going to be your business card that leads you to the next gig. It's like the people that are on that gig are noticing, you know, how you're doing and what you're doing. Yeah. And you're talking and, about sitting in the pub and playing with a singer songwriter for free and you're treating it the same way. You mean? Absolutely. Because the drummer that's on that gig, I mean, it's common in LA, you know, you'll have like somebody who's on some big tour. They, they're not mad at going out and playing a, you know, a singer songwriter gig the next night when they get back from some huge tour, they'll come and they're playing for, you know, 12 people at a bar so you know if you do a great job that drummer's like oh you know the next big tour we need a bass player and this you know this guy's taking stuff seriously he sounds great maybe i'll pull him in for the audition you know and sort of everybody's sort of you know clocking each other like that um and another thing you know that i feel like i sort of pay attention paid attention to and still do is how i'm viewing other people on a gig and when I'm, when somebody says, Hey, John, can you recommend a guitar player? What is my thought process? How am I thinking about who I'm going to recommend? And how does that reflect, you know, how I'm going to present myself to get recommended by somebody? Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, your reputation is essentially being put on the line uh, on someone else's behalf at that point. You don't recommend just anybody. For sure. That's right. Yeah. And what do you think about when you think about, Oh, should I recommend this person or not? You go, Oh, let's see. Oh yeah, they showed up to that last gig and they were late and their amp broke and uh, you know, <laughs> or they sh they showed up and knew all the songs perfectly and they were super cool and like they were amazing, you know. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of different pieces to that, but I think that's with any kind of a business endeavor, you've got to be personable, you've got to be professional, and you've got to be 
really good at what you do. And that, that sounds like the same way that most people would try to build any business and yours apparently has gotten successful. So <laughs> is, is that kind of how you want to, you want to kind of briefly, uh, I don't mean to pound your bio into submission, but you want to give a brief overview as to, in terms of l- how you leveraged uh, your personality, your ability to learn the tunes or read the tunes in a, in a professional manner and be timely and all that kind of stuff. How did that lead to your first big gig? And, you know, kind of give us a, a little highlight reel of, of what led to what, because I know it's kind of interesting how those things worked out for you. Uh, yeah. So my first break sort of to get on a like major label, you know, artist tour, um, I had been doing some subbing for a bass player named Mike Elizondo. Um, and he became a good friend of mine. And he, you know, Mike Elizondo went on to like co-write songs with Dr. Dre and 50 Cent. And he's like <laughs> become a huge like musical music industry mogul. But at that time, yeah, he he and I were like, you know, doing the hotel lobby, you know, playing upright bass at a wedding, all that kind of stuff. And so he would sometimes sub those kind of gigs to me. Um, and we became good friends. And he, you know, would hear back that I did a good job at those. And, um, you know, we had some friends in common and whatever. He uh, he had played on a record for this girl called Rebecca. Um, and they were uh, auditioning people for a tour. And he was like, hey, I'm going to recommend you for this, you know, this artist, the record I played on. And so uh, I ended up getting that gig. Um, and on that gig, I met some other musicians that were pros and stuff. Um, You're not naming one of those names guys, at this point? Uh, well, so one of the guys on that uh, gig was a guy named Jim McGorman, um, who's gone on to play with everybody on the planet. Um, fantastic, plays keyboards and guitar and sings great. Really versatile guy. Um, great musician. And a good friend. Um, we became super. We met on that that tour. We didn't know each other before that, um, and we became good friends and worked on a few different projects together. And he called me up and said, "Hey, there's this girl Michelle Branch that nobody had ever heard of that was like 17 years old and had just finished her first record." Um, and he was like, "Hey, uh, I was thinking you and a couple other friends of ours we could sort of." put a band together and audition for her as sort of a band. And then we could all go on tour with our friends. Um, and so we did that and we got that tour. Um, and the cool thing about that was that, like I said, nobody had heard of Michelle branch at that time. And she blew up and had like a top 10 single or two, um, and got pretty big. And so then that sort of, uh, gave me that calling card of, oh, I've toured with somebody you've heard of and they're like a top 10 artist. And that was definitely a you know good calling card. Yeah, a little street cred now. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard to get that. Like, how do you get that big gig if you've never had a big gig fo- before? Sort of that catch 22, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that sort of helped me out with that. I forget some of the other artists I played <laughs> after <laughs> Michelle Branch. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm it's probably... only because you're old, not because they weren't valuable. <laughs> Definitely. Um, well, so there were some other people along the line, but at some point I started playing with a, a Latin artist named Robbie Droco Rosa. And he's a guy that uh, produced Ricky Martin's big record. Um, and he's very well known in South America, like huge. Um, and I played with him for a while which was amazing got to go to south america several times and do all that um and then when that gig ended um on the michelle branch tour uh we shakira had a big album at the same time as michelle branch and we played a lot of the same radio festivals and tv shows and stuff like that and i sort of started to meet shakira's band um and became friends with them um and one of the guys shakira's drummer Brendan Buckley, um, they were looking for a bass player for a Shakira tour. 
Um, and he was sort of like, oh, this guy, John Button, he played with Robbie Rosa, this Latin artist, who's also sort of known for being difficult on musicians, and so is Shakira. Um, and he also played with Michelle Branch, this pop girl singer, and he was like, man, those two things kind of, uh, in his mind, equaled like, oh, he might be a good fit for Shakira. Um, so he he called me up and said, hey, uh, did I audition for that? No, I didn't. They just, I just ended up <laughs> jumping yeah. in. So yeah, it was so technically I, an, aud- an on-the-job audition, essentially, right? <laughs> yes, which is kind of common. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, you know, that's how those gigs sort of like were just who I knew from each gig led to the next gig. Um, and then after the Shakira gig, we go back to my friend, Mike Elizondo that hooked me up with that first gig with, uh, with Rebecca. So I finished the Shakira gig. It, well, they, you know, we did, I did like two and a half years all over the world with Shakira, which was amazing. That comes to an an end. Um, she's going to take six months or a year off. So, I'm sitting at home sort of like, what am I going to do now that this tour is over? What next? Um, and I'm watching TV and I see uh, Cheryl Crow playing a TV show and my old buddy, Mike Elizondo is playing bass. But this is at the point where he's already like uh, written in the club for 50 cent and like, co-produced and written all these songs with dr dre and like i'm like you know mike's not gonna go on tour with he needs a new Shell gig. Crow. he wants yeah right he wants you know he would love to go on tour with shell crow but he's getting like calls to produce like fiona apple's record and you know like you yeah know, yeah he's not he's not gonna do that tour so i call him up and i'm like hey mike uh this shakira tour that i was on it, that just came to an end and if you hear of anything, anybody that needs a bass player, let, let me know. Click. Call, he calls back. Hey, funny you should call. I'm doing this Cheryl Crow tour, and or I, this, you know, I've been doing a couple TV shows with her, but I'm not going to be able to do the tour. So I'll throw your name in the hat for the audition. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and that's pro- um, it's being proactive, but you know, not pushy, and it's again people you know from the experience you've garnered to that point. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and I gotta say, you know, it, it took a little bit of, a little bit of cojones to just call him up and be like, Hey, you know, like, I mean, I knew him, he was a friend, but uh, you know, there was part of me that was like, Oh, I don't know if, uh, if I should do that, you know, but I did. Yeah. Thankfully. Trying to, yeah. Try uh, not to be presumptuous though. Right. But yeah. yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Um, so then I auditioned for Cheryl Crow and managed to get that gig. And that was amazing. I mean, I, I was a huge fan of hers and her band is so amazing. The other musicians in that band. I mean, that was just an absolute dream to do that tour. I toured with her for I think a year and a half or something. Um, and of course that tour came to an end, you know, she was going to do other things and you sort of go, wow, Cheryl Crow, like, where do you go from there? I literally <laughs> was just sitting at home talking to my wife, like, man, I don't know. Uh, that, like, that's like the, the top of the heap. Like, what do you do? And then I get a call. Another friend of a friend was recommended me to audition for Roger Daltrey. Um, and I managed to, Get that gig, which was amazing. I so, mean, Roger Daltrey <laughs> from The Who. So, um, what was that audition like? Tell me what. Tell me what uh, an audition consists of, because I do know a lot of these. A lot of these bands are doing. Hey, I've heard from so and so, whom I trust, that you're the man. So, come on, let's see how you do. We have a few gigs or a you know short stint, but w- once you get to an actual audition, how does that work out for you? You know they they run the gamut. I I find they vary a lot. Um, Roger Daltrey's audition was a bit odd, uh, to me in that. So they gave us, I forget, like five or six songs to learn. That's pretty standard. They'll give you, you know, somewhere between three and six songs, like, Hey, learn these songs and come in. So I worked my butt off as I usually do. Um, I'm, I'm a stickler for being prepared and I, you know, I try to work hard. Um, so, you know, I learned these songs inside and out and thought I had them really down and we get there and 
Roger's like, ah, let's just jam. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, hey, do you know this song? Of, well, I forget what he wanted. Some like. Was it uh, one of his old... songs or a different song? No, no. It was like, <laughs> what song? I, some, I forget. Like, you know, so we just, we just jammed. Just grabbed a cover and started, that was it. started just vamping yeah. on stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. And we, you know, we didn't play any of the stuff that I like labored on for hours, but it worked out. Um, yeah. And he, he hired me and I, I worked with him for a long time. I was playing with him for about eight years, which was amazing. What a great gig. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and, uh, and then cut to uh, Pino Palladino had been playing with The Who for years. Uh, he took over when John Entwistle passed away. Um, and Pino Palladino is like a hero of mine. I mean, he's, for people that don't know, he's like uh, basically the most respected session bass player on the planet. Um, he's so, a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he... Uh, apparently the who didn't have a ton of work whatever year that was i think that was 2017 um and pino palladino also plays with john mayer and john had called him up to do like a year and a half of solid touring with the john mayer trio and i think that was a pretty lucrative thing for pino so pino was like hey yeah. i'm gonna go do this john mayer thing it's a cool um gig. cool gig for him yeah yeah for the, sure the steve jordan um, he and steve jordan and john mayer right yeah, and I would imagine, you know, if there are three people on stage, you know, you're stretching. The, uh, <laughs> the mo- well, also the money is probably pretty right. good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know the how much that entered his. And also, I mean, I think you know he had been doing the Who for a long time, and I think, like you say, he can kind of stretch out on John's gig. It's kind of a different thing. I don't. Mm-hmm. I I have no idea what his uh, decision, what what led him to that decision, but. The end result is he was leaving the who so the who needed a bass player um and so i don't know who all they were considering i know they were considering other bass players and clearly the who can like they can get anybody um and <laughs> their manager their man who's also roger's manager call calls me up and is like hey we need a bass player for the who uh would you be interested <laughs> like, pause pause <laughs> duh uh. <laughs> um so i'm like of course he's like okay well we're looking at some other people we'll call you back soon i was like uh okay wow so then like a week goes by and i'm just like in agony <laughs> like you know cuz you, you know part of your mind is like moving into like the gig yeah you know it's, a, it's like yeah, that's a big tease that that's basically exactly a tease. are you interested but, we're thinking about it we'll call you later yeah oh man <laughs> um but eventually what seemed like a year later <laughs> i guess it was a week but seemed like a year um they call back and they said they want they had like six or seven shows in england over the course of about three weeks um and then like a month off and then some subsequent bunch of other touring after that so basically the idea was roger was sort of singing my praises to pete townsend but pete didn't know my playing at all so he was basically like let's do these six shows try them out another you know Mm -hmm. audition on the job um and see how it goes and so um and I assume you're we, fairly familiar with a lot of those tunes by then, too, having played with Roger all those years. Absolutely. Yeah, we played a ton of Who stuff with Roger. So most of the music I already had played with Roger. So super. Yeah, I was already most of the way there. Um, yeah, so we, I flew to England and we rehearsed, did like a few short rehearsals. And then... Uh, my first gig was Royal Albert Hall filmed for a DVD and uh, cable TV. Love it. Special. <laughs> Love it. 
Welcome to the Who. <laughs> exactly. I think we ran through most of the songs before we started performing them. I, there might have been a couple that we never ran through. I, it's wow, man. <laughs> It's that is a fly by the seat of your pants gig, man. It's crazy. That it's, is fantastic. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. What a fantastic story. And again, it's it's a tribute to you because of your professionalism. And you are one of the nice guys on the face of the planet. And I know you wouldn't say uh, that, but thanks. that but I know that's a contributing factor. It's it's super hard not to like you. And if you oh, can, thanks. well, if you can do that and in any kind of profession, it, you know, that's, it's not a learned trait, obviously. I mean, there are people that just are who they are. So I think that really uh, bodes well for you and for good reason. And it's deserved. Thank you. And I, I gotta say, I think it's uh, especially important in the music touring world because you're living with these people. You're in each other's faces for weeks at a time. You're away from your family and your friends. And, you know, you're either on a bus or, you know, you're around each other 24 um, seven. You know, it's not like a normal job where you're there nine to five and then you're home most of the time. And on weekends, I mean, you're just in each other's faces. And so, you know, if people aren't easygoing, it's, it's really challenging and it, it makes it a lot easier. And also, I mean, on top of it, you know, you're, you're at the airport at five 30 AM after playing a show the night before and like people get punchy. It's easy to get frustrated and yeah, you know, yeah. um, but if people are even killed and easy going, man, it, it, it makes a big difference. I think that's yeah, familial. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, seriously. So speaking of familial, so you have a yeah. you have a fantastic family. Your how did you tell tell a little bit about how you met your wife and at what point in your career were you and what she's an actress. So where was she in terms of uh, when you guys met and how that work out? Oh, let's see. Um, when I met her, I was playing with Robbie Draco Rosa, the Latin artist. Okay. Um, and I was just about to get the Shakira tour. Um, I got that tour not too long after I met her, which was a bit complicated because I was gone a lot. On yes, that tour. That's not a good dating um, life. Yeah. Right. Um, we were set up by a mutual friend. Um, and, uh, yeah, she was, when I met her, she was, uh, just, she was working a waitressing job, but was just transitioning into doing, uh, she had just booked several, big national commercials. Mm -hmm. um, and not too long after I met her, I remember she forgot to go to her shift at the restaurant because she was shooting a commercial. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So that was sort of like the writing on the wall. Like, you know, I guess I'm done with waitressing. <laughs> yeah, it was divine. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so she's, she's moved on to, you know, doing a whole bunch of guest stars on all kinds of TV shows and done some movies and stuff like that. Um, and it's interesting because I feel like both of us, not only, not only are we both freelance people, so we understand each other's, you know, the ups and downs financially and, and emotionally mm -hmm. of going from gig to gig. Um, but also I feel like both of us are just sort of like working stiffs in our fields you know she's not a famous movie star i'm not a rock star we're both you know just i'm a working musician she's a working actress like you know we we do our craft um and we're you know yeah we're not she... uh we're not celebrities <laughs> and, and i guess you guys see eye to eye financial stuff and all that because that's got to yeah. be a key too. understanding those dips and stuff when you're in between gigs and everything for sure i mean it's a mixed bag because you know, I have other musician friends whose significant other has that financial stability that they can sort of fall back on, <laughs> which is interesting. Because, you know, there are times when, I mean, for the most part, our uh, careers have been sort of uh, yin and yang where, you know, she'll work, then I'll work, then, you know. But there are times when we both have a dip and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're enjoying this time together, but uh, who's going to buy yeah. food? exactly yeah so you know but 
like you said, we both understand, you know, it's interesting to be, to have a, a really good year and not go out and, you know, blow it on fancy cars and all that kind of stuff. Mm. We both know that, Hey, we got to sock some money away because in two years we might not make any money. Sure. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. weird. Um, but like you say, we both understand that. So that's, that's a, it's great to see eye to eye that way and understand that. Well, obviously you married up. Uh, so that's, that's impressive as did I, by hey, the for way. Sure. Yeah. We're <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> two nerds that got lucky and married up. Uh, so Word. That's very cool. That's very cool. And it's an interesting profession that she has too. And, and just having, having that similar lifestyle seat of your pants, I call it because it's, that's stressful just going and getting done with a gig and then trying to figure out what's next. So that's yeah. admirable that you guys can coordinate and which, which leads me to the next question. Like, how do you decide? I assume you're everything that you've done is kind of plotting and in terms of, hey, I'm going to save to this, I'm going to get to that, I'm going to meet this person, I'm going to try to get to this gig and this level, whatever. And now you have a cool little kid, a little yeah. dude. Like, was, yeah. was that a decision that you said, hey, uh, we both have a gig, let's have a kid? Or how did that come about? Because that's another interesting little mixture of events that now changes a lot of your priorities, where you kind of have less choices to make about where your career paths are going to go, right? To an extent. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, like they say, there's, there's not really ever a good time. If like you wait for the right time to have a kid, you never will. Right. I think, um, so both of us, yeah, wanted, you know, we were wanting to have a kid and I think we got to a certain point where we thought like, you know, we both have reached a level of success that I, you know, we think it's going to keep going and not suddenly all come crashing down. Yeah. So, it, you know, it seemed like, it seemed like the right time, and I think it was. Um, I think one thing, uh, one of the many things that it changed having a kid is, uh, you know, if I'm going to take any kind of tour, um, you know, we have to have a conversation between my wife and I, like, hey, you know, because I've, I, I didn't really mention in my little synopsis of my career path, I've done a couple of, uh, big artists in other countries. So I played with a French singer for a while. And I also did a lot of work with a Japanese artist and those would involve, you know, me going to those places for long periods of time. Right. Um, you know, and those are conversations that she and I have to sort of talk about and how much I'm going to be away and how much they're going to come over and visit me. And it's tough, you know, for my wife to leave town when she has auditions and, you know, things in her career coming up. So those are all things that we have to sort of sit down and talk about and weigh the, weigh the options and all that. Yeah. But it's obviously worth it. And I could tell just by, you know, the, uh, the way that you spoke about him when we talked last, really interested in, in him and how he's growing and, the decisions he makes and what are some of your philosophies or what are some of the things that you like to do without necessarily exposing anything, you know, too personal. But I find it interesting. You've lived in Alaska and you've lived in the Dallas area and then you've lived in LA and you see a lot of the stuff is going on out there where LA is one of the main focal points of the U S and obviously uh, between COVID and demonstrations and everything else, uh, you've got a lot to teach a kid that is forming decisions and and opinions about the world around him. So I'm interested to hear if if you know if you've sat him down and had these discussions, or is it even time, or how do you approach all that? Um. Yes. Yeah, so just for context, my son just turned seven. Um. And yeah, we talk about everything with him. You know, we, we, he's, and actually I, I got to say my wife has been really active in, uh, social justice and black lives matter. She's really, uh, stepping up to the plate on that. And so fantastic. we've, uh, we've had a lot of conversations with him about that. Um, and, uh, he seems to really get it. Um, and I mean, you, you know, you can't not talk about, what's going on with the, uh, with COVID and all that. I mean, that's just sure. so in your face. <laughs> Literally. Um, yeah. Put this on. Put <laughs> yeah, this exactly. on. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, we've definitely, you know, we've gone out to a couple uh, demonstrations and, you know, with him and held up Black Lives Matter signs. And, uh, you know, we uh, we all as a family got together and put a huge Black Lives Matter sign in chalk on the front of our house. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we've we've talked about all that all that with him, um, at least what our feelings are about it. Yeah. You know. And he's a super creative kid. You can tell he's he's probably going to he be absolutely is some kind of artist of of some sort. Uh, certainly, with, we'll see. Yeah, certainly with the parents that he has, even by accident, he's going to be something in the I creative guess. industry. <laughs> yeah, but I I think one of the overarching things with him is we want him to be uh, kind and compassionate. You know, mm-hmm. I think that's that's a, a worthwhile trait for a human. Oh, no question. And it's interesting, too, because a lot of a lot of some of the issues that have been born of whether it be racism or systemic issues that have cropped up and, and certainly at least the discussions at the very least about things that uh, that we are missing, I think, stem from a lack of education when we're small. I mean, that's right. I mean, yeah. I didn't learn about any of this stuff until I started living this stuff. And. I think it's admirable that you're filling him in at a at that. At, I mean, at the ripe age, but it's important to to go into things with some context when you finally start learning the the issues. Yeah, I mean, I think when you and I grew up, uh, it, it was polite to not talk about race, right? Yeah, kind of. I mean, even when we were playing, I mean, we played. Yeah, and we were just, you know sharing La Quintas with. Three other black guys, and we were the yeah. you know the there were two other black guys, a couple of white guys, whatever we're mixed in, and we and we, you know, we like to think that we were trying to to preach the the forward thinking message, but it is a di- it was certainly a difficult conversation back then for sure. Yeah, and it was just a conversation you generally didn't have. Um, so, which is odd, I think, especially yeah, in light of is, yeah. you know some of the messages that were trying to put out but it's difficult to have the conversation with your own brother that's sitting in the room yeah um so yeah we're we're talking about it now thank goodness well that's so impressive and i can't tell you how appreciative i am that you're willing to share your story and uh talk about your family and everything else the things that you've done i think are are quite amazing i think you're an amazing dude obviously i consider you a, a great friend and anytime that i can do anything for you just let me know but uh i've been honored to spend the time with you man i really appreciate it brother back at you all right tell la i said what's up absolutely many a fool can a kingdom rule as long as they don't look back in school it's hard work over fact freedom you gotta get free now welcome welcome to the song mm-hmm. who don't be sitting down yep Happily, do this for those before and after me. Trying to pass the baton forward like I'm happily. Took mine and ran with it, now I'm thinking about the next generation. Give them a platform for progress. Butterfly effect, coming live and direct. Ain't no telling how our decisions will manifest. I ain't crying for help. I can do this on my own, set my bread, build my wealth.